Before we turn to the word of God, would you join me again briefly as we talk to the God of the word. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, for we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You know, uh, 2022 didn't go exactly the way I planned. Did it go the way you planned? (laughs) If you're human, you probably have some regrets about last year. You know, uh, one of the devil's most effective tools to defeat us and keep us mired in failure is to remind us over and over of our regrets, our failures. You know, the word Satan means accuser of the brethren, accuser. And he likes to do that. He likes to accuse us. You did this. You failed. He loves doing that. You know, every day it's like he points to our past and he says, See, you're nothing but a big failure. You'll never amount to anything. A phony. All of us know the pain of regrets, mistakes, harsh words, missed opportunities. Maybe a broken marriage, an abortion, a painful relationship, something you did or failed to do. But folks, you can live with no regrets. William Borden is a man that lived with no regrets. He graduated high school in 1904. He was the heir to the Borden Dairy family fortune. I don't know if you I grew up with Borden Dairy products. Yeah. His graduation gift from his parents, a trip around the world. While he was in Asia, the Middle East, and Europe, Borden grew concerned for the hurting people that he saw. And writing home, he said, I'm going to give my life to prepare for the mission field. When he made his decision, in the back of his Bible, he wrote two words. He wrote, no reserves. After graduation from Yale University, he was offered many high-paying jobs, but he turned them all down. And then he entered two more words in his Bible, no retreats. Completing studies at Princeton Seminary for the ministry, Borden sailed for China to work with Muslims, but first he stopped in Egypt to make preparations. But while he was in Egypt, he was stricken with spinal meningitis, and he died within a month. A waste, you say? Not in God's plan. He influenced hundreds, if not thousands, of students to pursue prayer and to pursue missions. He led many to Christ. And in his Bible, underneath the words, no reserves and no retreats, he wrote the words, no regrets. No regrets. Wouldn't you like to live like that? All of us would like to live like that. However, the truth is most of us have regrets. So how can a person live with no regrets? How do you do it? Where do you start? What do you do? Well, God's word helps us with this subject. And today we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. The New Testament, Philippians chapter 3, 13 to 15. I'm going to read actually verses 12 to 16 using the New International Version. The Apostle Paul is writing here. Look at what he says, beginning in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Folks, let me tell you something. If anyone had reason for regrets, it was Paul the Apostle. Before his conversion to Christ, as Saul, he persecuted the church. The Bible records that he stood by while Stephen was stoned to death. He was a thorn in the side of the early church, so effective he was in persecuting them. But he came to faith in Christ and moved beyond his regrets. How did he do it? Well, Paul teaches us three valuable lessons that helped him live with no regrets. And if you're saved, if you're a born-again child of God, the first step to no regrets is this. 
You must exercise faith. You must exercise faith. For faith to benefit us, it must be exercised. Does an exercise program help you if you don't do it? No. A lot of people make New Year's resolutions, right? I'm going to exercise more this year. But if you never do it, it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything, right? And in the same way, faith has no benefit unless you exercise it. To live with no regrets, exercising your faith means you must trust God. Just like that little boy there getting ready to jump off into the water. He has to trust his mom to catch him, right? It isn't faith in action until he actually jumps. And sometimes it's like a leap of faith for us, too, to trust God, isn't it? We have to exercise our faith. Folks, listen, God offers a fresh start. Wouldn't it be great if you could buy this? (laughs) Package of fresh start in life. Be who you were born. Well, God offers this. Do you believe him? Only faith in Jesus Christ offers the possibility of a new start. God gave the Apostle Paul a new start. The Bible says in in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation, a new creature. The old has gone, the new has come. I don't know who said this, but I like it. Though no one can go back and make a new beginning, anyone can start from now and make a brand new end. (laughs) I like that. You know, I experienced a new beginning of sorts once when I put some shelves together. Marion may remember these shelves. Assembly of the shelves seemed like an easy task, and I decided, I don't need instructions. (laughs) There's only a couple steps here, right? Right. And when the shelves didn't fit properly, I had to take them all apart and start all over again. Second time, I used the instruction sheet. (laughs) Okay, Life is like that sometimes, isn't it? Many times we try working through problems only to realize that we just totally messed things up on our own. And it helps to go back to the instruction manual, which for the child of God is the Bible. That's right. Helps to go back to the instruction manual and start over. The beautiful part is that God alone gives us an opportunity to start completely over. I don't know your life today, but let me ask you this question. Do you need to do over a a spiritual mulligan, if you please? What's a mulligan? Anybody ever play golf? It's a do-over. It's when you make a really bad shot. It goes out in the rough. You go, I want a mulligan. And you start all over. You you tee off again. You start over, right? Sometimes we need a spiritual mulligan. Faith offers us the possibility of a fresh start. However, it also offers us forgiveness for our sins, for our mistakes, for our failures. There are some wonderful promises in the Bible concerning forgiveness. One of my favorites is found in Psalm 103, verse 12. The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. How far is the east from the west? Well, you never can get there, right? (laughs) You never, it keeps moving, all right? What a great picture. So the first step is to exercise faith. If you want to live with no regrets, you need to exercise your faith. The second step for you to live with no regrets as a child of God is you must learn to forget. You must learn to forget. Like, like with childlike faith, just trust the Lord and go forward. Forget the past. Paul said, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Those of us that are older than 50 know the frustration of forgetting, don't we? (laughs) Seems like it gets worse with every passing year. I know it's up there somewhere, like I just remember, right? (laughs) However, there are times when forgetfulness is a good thing. All of us have experiences we'd like to leave behind. I like the title of this book, Forgetting Your Past. We need to learn to forget the past. Times when we want to forget things. Consider the experience of Reverend A.J. Jones, who placed an advertisement in a daily newspaper. See if you want, if you ought to forget anything here. Look at this. Monday, the Reverend A.J. Jones has one color TV set for sale. The telephone number is there after 7 p.m. and asks for Mrs. Donnelly, who lives with him cheap. Tuesday, a correction. We regret any embarrassment caused to Reverend Jones by a typographical error in yesterday's paper. The ad should have read, the Reverend A.J. Jones has one color TV set for sale, cheap, telephone number there, and ask for Mrs. Donnelly, who lives with him after 7 p.m. 
Wednesday, the Reverend A.J. Jones informs us that he has received several annoying telephone calls because of an incorrect ad in yesterday's paper. It should have read, the Reverend A.J. Jones has one color TV set for sale, cheap telephone 626-1313 after 7 p.m. and asked for Mrs. Donnelly, who loves with him. <laughs> and then on Thursday... Please take notice that I, the Reverend A.J. Jones, have no color TV set for sale. I have smashed it. (laughs) Don't call the phone number anymore. I have not been carrying on with Mrs. Donnelly. She was until yesterday my housekeeper. (laughs) Obviously, Reverend Jones wanted to forget that experience, right? (laughs) We want to forget. We need to forget sometimes. So, So what's the solution? Paul tells us. He says, one thing I do... Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Folks, our past, our past can be a nightmare that sticks with us sometimes. No matter what the situation, we must move beyond it. Now, I'm not talking about people who don't have any conscience about things they've done wrong. Some people have no remorse for their sins and shortcomings. It kind of reminds me of a little boy who broke a dish and went to his mother and he said, Mother, I did it. I'm sorry, and I hope this will be the end of the matter. <laughs> well, he, he wanted to avoid the consequences of his actions, right? I'm not talking about that. And encouraging forgetfulness, I'm talking to the person who has dealt with their sin and seeks God's forgiveness in a sincere way. In such situations, God wants you to move beyond your regrets, to forget the past. He wants to give you a new start in life. Some of you may remember the name Charles Colson. Charles Colson was the aide to Richard Nixon, who was sent to jail for Watergate. As a result of his experience as a convicted felon, Colson founded Prison Fellowship. It's now the world's largest Christian outreach to prisoners and their families. It has more than 50,000 volunteers working in hundreds of prisons in 88 countries all around the world. A ministry that has blessed millions of people got started 46 years ago because Charles Colson went to prison for a serious mistake that he made. God alone is able to take our failures and turn them into his successes. He can do it. He's been doing it since the Garden of Eden, right folks? He knows how to do it. But the story that matters most to you and me isn't Peter's. It isn't Paul's. It's not even Chuck Colson's. It's your story. That's the one that matters most to us. What I'm telling you this morning is that the story of your life has not been ruined by any mistakes you may have made. Not by your sin or anybody else's. God's good plan for your life and mine is not buried under the mistakes of our past. God has a plan for your life, a good plan, a wise plan as his child. It's a loving plan. It's a plan that is still in effect no matter what mistakes we make. You haven't missed it. He's working out that plan in your life right now. Do you believe that? Sometimes it takes faith to believe that. Will you believe him? And Will you renew your commitment today to seeking God, following him and serving him with your whole heart? free of the past, no longer weighed down by regrets. Folks, listen, none of us can avoid regrets. All of us have made bad choices. All of us have disobeyed God. All of us face the effect of sin in our lives. All of us are influenced by Satan's daily attacks. If you don't believe me, just go into ministry. You have a target on your back. The important thing is to deal with our past. Ask God's forgiveness and move on with our lives as we seek to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So you must forget your failures. Forget the past, forget your failures. Our failures are in the past. So there is a sense in which dealing with the past means dealing with our failures. However, a failure is a unique breed all of its own. Failure, it's something that seems to follow us wherever we go. And failure can be both good and bad. John Maxwell wrote a very interesting book. It's called Failing Forward. Failing Forward. It emphasizes that failure can be positive. When we fail, we can fail forward. We can learn from that failure. Move on to success. 
We must be careful about f- of failing backwards. We need to avoid that. To fail backwards is to fall into destructive failure. You know, the story of the Bible has the story of many people's lives that are there for us to learn from. And many people that we think of saints failed in life, failed badly. After coming off the ark, do you remember Noah got drunk? After following God, Abraham lied about his wife Sarah. After becoming king of Israel, David committed adultery, had a man killed. After building the temple in Jerusalem, Solomon disobeyed God by marrying foreign wives who worshipped pagan gods. After accepting Jesus' call to discipleship, remember what Peter did? He denied him. Not far from my hometown is Edison, New Jersey, where Thomas Edison had a laboratory. Invented the light bulb. And I remember reading that Thomas Edison's experimental laboratory was destroyed once by fire. It was said that Edison responded to that tragedy by saying this. Listen to what he said. Thank God, 20,000 mistakes have been burned up. (laughs) I don't know if I would have responded that way. (laughs) What an attitude. So the first step for you to live with no regrets is we need to exercise faith. And then you need to learn to forget. The third step God is showing us today is that you need to sharpen your focus. You need to sharpen your focus. Paul said he was straining, straining toward what was ahead. He was focusing on what was ahead, not what was behind. What should you focus on today? Well, I would suggest that you should focus on your purpose. Paul was focused on his. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 22, he says, if I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Paul was focused on God's purpose for him in this life. And what was God's purpose for him? It was to live and serve Jesus Christ, to win the lost, to glorify him with his life. Folks, I would suggest to you that that should be our purpose as well. To serve God where he has put us. To reach out to those who are lost and hurting and point them to the Savior. And to serve God and glorify him with our lives. If we don't focus on the purpose that God has for us, it's not likely that we'll accomplish much in life, much that is eternal and lasting. Are you living for God's purpose in your life? You know, modern-day Americans, we pride ourselves in multitasking, don't we? Well, I can do this, this, and this, you know. I can live for success, make a lot of money, focus on that, and I can also serve God. Multitasking. But research shows we fool ourselves to think we accomplish more. Multitasking, focusing on several things, only slows us down, and it can even paralyze our progress. I read a great illustration of how that happens. William Henson tells us why animal trainers always carried a chair when they went into a lion cage. Did you ever wonder about that? Like, what defense would a chair be against the lion, right? Listen to what he says. They had whips, of course, and pistols at their sides, but they always had a chair. Henson says it's the trainer's most important tool. He holds the chair by the back, and he thrusts the legs toward the face of the lion. Those who know about lion training maintain that the animal tries to focus on all four legs at one time. In an attempt to focus on all four, a kind of paralysis overwhelms the animal and it becomes tame, weak, and disabled because its attention is divided. Isn't that interesting? It's a distraction. And we too can be distracted by having many things out there, irons in the fire as they say, right? Trying to multitask. And we need to learn to focus, to focus on God's promises. Paul was focused on the promises of God. Look with me at verses 20 to 21. He says in Philippians 3, verse 20, But our citizenship is where? In heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The Bible tells us that in this life God promises, promises to lead us, to guide us, to protect us, to to meet the needs of his children. But it also talks of the day we will be redeemed and leave this body. And it says that for us to be absent from the body is what? To be present with the Lord. 
Do you believe that? I'm told that two days before Pastor Adrian Rogers died, and Adrian Rogers, I don't know if you ever heard him preach, he's one of the greatest preachers of our times. Two days before he died, his good friend Jerry Vines went to visit him. Dr. Rogers told Jerry that he was in a win-win situation. He said if God leaves him here, he would be able to see his family and serve the Lord. However, if God carried him home, he would see Jesus. And Dr. Rogers saw that as a win-win, a win-win situation. Folks, the only way, the only way to live a win-win life with no regrets is to focus on the promises of God, serve him, and glorify him with our lives. So if you want to live with no regrets, what should you do? Well, start with choosing a life of faith in Jesus Christ. Become a Christ follower. Don't just read the Bible. Don't just study the Bible. Live the Bible. Live it. And then second, learn to forget the past. Forget your failures. The third step is to focus on your purpose and the promises of God. Focus on the purpose and the promises of God. For everyone who comes to Christ, a challenge is to move beyond the regrets and sins of our past. The devil, our enemy, the accuser of the brethren, wants us to live in the past. To keep regretting our regrets as long as we're alive. And it'll keep us from doing anything for the Lord. And Jesus is saying to you today, folks, the devil is a big liar. I died for those sins, those failures, those mistakes, those regrets. All you have to do is come to me with your sin, and I will wash it away forever. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, I remember memorizing this as a child, 1 John 1, 9. Remember what it says? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. All right, let's apply this personally. The Bible is very clear on what we should do with our regrets. First of all, admit them. Get them off your chest. Say, God, I admit that nine years ago I cheated on my spouse. I was dead wrong. I am so sorry. Or, God, I told a really big lie. I take full and complete responsibility. And I'm truly sorry. Or, God, there's something I should have done, but I, I went back on my word and I didn't do it. Please forgive me. I was wrong. Whatever the regret is, admit it. Clear the air between you and God if you haven't done it yet. If you can, make it right with those you've wronged. Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. The second thing you should do is accept God's forgiveness. Some have admitted their past mistakes, but they've never really accepted the fact that they've been forgiven. Deep down, there's a part that thinks I'm not good enough. My behavior in the past was so bad, so wrong, I'm going to have to earn my forgiveness. And that's human nature. Nothing could be further from the truth, however. When God forgives a person, he forgives them the moment they ask. In Psalm 32, David says, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. When God forgives, he forgives immediately and completely. Isn't that good news? The third thing you need to do is believe that you're really forgiven. Only God can forgive you. And he does that in Christ. You'll never get to the place where you can forgive yourself, folks. We can't because we, we expect better from ourselves and we disappoint ourselves. But God forgives us. And believe that you're forgiven is an act of faith. Only he can forgive you in Christ. And you'll never get to the place where you forgive yourself. You can't. You've offended a holy God. He forgives you in Christ. Case closed. You accept it by faith. You know, if we don't believe we're forgiven, we start thinking that God is punishing us some, every time something goes wrong. When we have car trouble, we get sick, we think, see, the Lord's disciplining me again. Maybe you've been there. I have. He's paying me back from my sins. Folks, that's not how God works. That's not how he works. Look at what Jeremiah 31, 34 says. For I will forgive their wickedness, God says, and will remember their sins no more. God's not thinking of ways to make your life miserable just because of something you did way back in 2010. I like this Google slide that somebody came up with. Can you see that they did a Google search for wickedness and sins? And it says showing results. 
No results found. If you've ever done a Google search, you've seen a box like that. That's what God says. He says, I will forget them. I'll remember them no more. That's amazing. God is not waiting to rub it in, folks. He wants to rub it out. If you've truly repented, then he forgave you and he forgot that lousy sin you did back in 2010. And all you have to do is believe it. Because it says so right here in the word of God. I will remember your sins no more. And then fourth, you need to stop punishing yourself. For some, this is the hardest part of all. We beat ourselves up for years over things that God doesn't even remember. <laughs> Isaiah 43, 18 tells us, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Folks, Jesus took your punishment and mine on the cross. It's paid for. Let him take away your regrets. This time of year, football is always in the news. Well, back in 1929, Georgia Tech played the University of California in the Rose Bowl. Just before halftime, California center Roy Regals recovered a fumble. But he was hit, making a pivot, and he wound up doing a U-turn, which faced him in the opposite direction. And then he ran 65 yards the wrong way. He was finally tackled at his own two-yard line by one of, his, one of his teammates. When California attempted to punt the ball, Georgia Tech blocked the pump, scored a safety, giving them a two-point lead. At halftime, the team headed off the field and went into their dressing room. As they sat in the benches, Regals put a blanket over his shoulders and sat down in the corner and put his face in his hands, and he cried like a baby. Right before the second half started, the coach said, Men, the same team that played the first half will start the second. The players all got up and headed back to the field except for Regals. The coach called him. He said, Roy, he didn't budge. So the coach said, Did you hear me? The same team starts the second half. Regals looked up with tears. He said, Coach, I can't go back out there. I hurt the team. I'm so embarrassed I can't go back out there and face the crowd. Coach Price simply put his hand on Roy's shoulder and then he said, Roy, the game's only half over. Get up and go on back. And Roy did. And everybody who saw it said that he played the greatest game of his life in the second half. Folks, like Roy Regals, some have been running in the wrong direction. We've made mistakes. We have regrets. And we're thinking, oh, I don't want to get up. I don't want to go out there and try anymore. I'm embarrassed. But folks, God is here and he's got his arm around you. And like the coach, he's telling you this morning, go on back. Get out there. Game's only half over. It's not done yet. What's in the past is in the past. Get out there. Move on with your life. Put your faith in God that he can still do something good. So what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Are you headed in the right direction? Because if you're not, you're going the wrong way. And when you die, no one will be laughing. Make sure you're headed in the right direction today. Toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Toward the gift of eternal life. And if you'd like to know more about how to begin a personal relationship with Christ, all you have to do is admit you're a sinner. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Believe that he died for your sin and confess him as your Lord. The Bible says you become a child of God this very day. God offers a fresh start. Accept his offer today of a fresh start. The Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Accept that by faith. I want to encourage you, don't spend the rest of your life regretting your past. I invite you to do what David did. Come back to God. Admit your sin. Admit your regrets and give them to God. Accept the forgiveness he offers in Christ and walk out of here free at last, free from the guilt of sin and free to move on with your life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, there may be some here today or listening online that this talk was just for them. They needed to hear what your word says. 
Lord, help them to take the next step toward living with no regrets, to believe you, to accept your forgiveness in Christ, and then live freely in your love, bringing glory to you, serving you and others with their lives. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.